recently read a book that absolutely captivated me. It's this, it's called Australia the Hard Way. It was published in 1972 and a story took place in 1969. And it's one man's attempt to take an 18 foot open boat from the UK all the way to Australia. And in the book he mentions he has a cameraman along to record the journey. And I got in touch with him and I said, have you still got that footage? And he said, well, only parts of it and there's no audio. And I said, how do you feel about narrating it? And he said, sure, let's give it a go. So this is his story. This was 1969. We left on the 28th of April yeah. from Chidester Harbour. Uh -huh. <clears throat> we went out with the cameraman on board from Southern Television to do the start. So Alex Rose came down to wave us off and the wind before we got to the mouth of the Chichester Harbour the wind got up to a full gale <laughs> so we had to go back to Thorny Island and hold the boat there for a bit mm -hmm. uh, and then went back home saw ourselves leave on television <laughs> <laughs> and then came back um, on, uh, on board and got over the next day so the, was the 20, 29th and then uh, got over to La Havre on the 30th evening Mm -hmm. and then spent uh, virtually a month, no less, probably three weeks to a month, going through the canals. Right. Uh, and then onwards from there, but we arrived in Australia uh, literally 342 days later. That was a whole passage. Wow. Well, this is after we'd uh, left the French waterways and are heading across to Marseille um, with a reasonable chop coming, but uh, it was a fairly straightforward passage there in the bay lovely sunshine and was that your, your like crew gear. member there? no that was me oh, that was crew you was it was it a, was a, a cameraman ah uh, ok and I had to take a cameraman to, to uh, let of course. film it yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is all our various belongings stowed down in a little 18 foot boat from, for a, a year of sailing wow and just some of the local craft around down the Mediterranean as we pulled, moved on down the south coast of France. So where are you here? Well this would be somewhere down the south coast of France, uh, having sort of picked up some fresh provisions because we've been living off of tin food and dried food and that's what we did live off for most of the journey. Wow. Unless we, until we could get some fresh foods. Yeah. And obviously tried a bit of fishing ourselves to supplement the uh, the dried food. <laughs> I guess it must be storage that's the big issue on this trip. The storage was, but I had, uh, I, I bought the boat, um, a bare boat, and then worked on it to make more lockers, and, and uh, watertight lockers and so on and so forth, to um, water kept tubes, plastic tubes of water, yeah. so we could carry enough. And there was our move into Italy where we tasted some uh, octopus for the first time, which was incredibly awful as far as it was it then. Well, I didn't know how to cook it properly. Yeah. <clears throat> and it came out as just as tough as tough. <laughs> and I think that, uh, that went over the side after the first mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> how do you catch an octopus? Well, we actually bought it in the market. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, 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 it was live when we bought it. But, uh, right. <laughs> and, uh, there's me trying to put a brave face on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then our aim was, of course, <clears throat> to go down the south coast of France, cross to um, the heel of Italy, and then to Corfu, and then through the, um, the Corinth Canal into the Aegean. And this is when we were down, at this time, we were down in the, in the Straits uh, opposite uh, um, Sicily. Uh, and those are the overfalls you get. And these are the, um, the fishermen that go out after swordfish. And they sit on the end of that long bowsprit while the helmsman's up the top of the tower. And then swing the bowsprit across where he's got a harpoon and they harpoon them. Wow. <coughs> That was in those days. I don't know how they do it now, but it's still a, a popular fish to catch. And once we got uh, across to uh, Greece, um, 
this is us, uh, in fact, going just about to start to go through the Corinth Canal, uh, which we had to wait a day because the ships coming to and fro through there, you had to log your time to go through. We had to demonstrate that we could do a minimum of six knots, oh, right. otherwise they wouldn't let us go through. <coughs> I'm just showing the, the building of the canal with the footprints of the six feet. They, they sort of scoured up the side of the walls. There we are. And that's the other side. Now, this is really where we got stuck in the uh, Meltemi, which starts around about the 20th of June. We've been trying to get ahead of that all the time. And unfortunately, through various delays, we got caught in it. And this is the island we went to, the shelter, when the first of the um, Mistral started. Of course, it lasts for about three months. Oh, wow. And we stuck ourselves there. Uh, it was an uninhabited except for a lighthouse. And eventually, virtually ran out of fuel. There was another boat bigger than us that was sheltering. Hmm. Um, I noticed that it dropped off in the evenings and then picked up in the mornings. So we decided to have a go one night to get across towards uh, Turkey uh, and uh, it did moderate off during the night but then it uh, blew up um, pretty hard and we had a really tough time, the rudder stock, the, the tiller head broke and uh, we ended up by trying to get the outboard to run and steer us and then the fuel pump went on the outboard and so we had to keep pumping the, the old uh, balloon and the fuel line mm -hmm. to keep it going and eventually we made uh, uh, as, uh, it was a Morgos um, with a boat full of water and uh, picking up a mouse in the Morgos before we went off again <laughs> which jumped ship which was probably just as well <laughs> anyways This is actually when we were in Turkey and we were in uh, Antalya there. Uh, we were heading to Mersin as so we've already had made arrangements for a truck to take us to, uh, to through the Kurdistan mountains to the upper reach of the Tigris River. And this was all part of the trip because there were problems on the Suez Canal, various fractions you know, fighting there at the time. And uh, I think there was a ship being sunk in it at that time to uh, block it off. So this is the only way we could really make a passage down to Australia, is, is going overland for a while and then uh, on down the Tigris River. And this, of course, is a place where we could get some fresh food on the way. And uh, we eventually <coughs> loaded the boat onto the truck with the help of the local Navy. They're very good to us. That's the naval ship without a long, young lieutenant, Captain Obitz, who spoke very good English and he and his team helped to uh, offload the dinghy, put it on the truck and then onload the stuff again. Ready for our trip across Kurdistan. There she is, up on the truck. What we didn't know was that the drivers, there was a driver and a mate, also the normal thing is if you're taking uh, something, cargo, whatever, on, on these trucks that then set off across Turkey, they then try and uh, get some extra money by allowing people hitchhiking, well not really hitchhiking, their whole families <coughs> walking down the dirt roads and uh, pull them on board the truck and making a few extra bob out of it. And uh, this is what they did, as you'll see later, and, uh, as we went through Kurdistan mountains. That's, you see, the sort of stuff we had on board actually fitted into a drastic lugger. That's incredible. <laughs> Now, all the roads really from here onwards 
through the Kurdistan mountains were just rough, you know, they were not tarmac at all. Except this is obviously just leaving Antalya, but you see the people that are just coming on board. At first we really objected to it, but in fact, this, once you got to the rough road and the truck was bouncing away, we thought the boat was going to be damaged. And by having people, more people on board, it actually sort of made the thing more solid. Wow. <laughs> and uh, allowed us to get through without too many bangs and knocks. And these are the sort of roads we were then on for hundreds of miles. <coughs> the sort of uh, very barren landscape and extremely hot mm. at that time. The first place we, we got to, though we stopped of course a number of times because it did take about three days to do, um, was a place called Jizre, which is on the Tigris River just in Turkey, very close to the Syrian border. And that was where we uh, were hoping to get on the river and set off. And eventually we did get on the Tigris River, but where, where we had a problem was that the authorities wouldn't let us launch at Jizre. And we then had to truck it again to uh, a, a town right on the border of Turkey and Syria and on a railway track. And they eventually we got on the train when it came, that's the Istanbul Baghdad Express, and that took us to Mosul. And at Mosul, we went on the river and got on it then for that thousand miles trip down the river to the then called Persian Gulf. And this is us sort of traveling down. Of course, it was getting late, you know, well into the summer, so the river was getting quite shallow. And so there were occasions like this where we literally had to dig a channel over some stony banks to be able to carry on down. We had uh, a few problems there. We actually broke through into one of the timbers and they had to get the boat out of the water and put a tingle on it to keep going. Um, <coughs> further on, once we got down to a place called Kut, uh, there was then that you had barges which were travelling then from Kut to Basra and uh, we actually had to help us go a little bit quicker we had a tow on one of these barges it's here for a couple of days uh, to get us down to the where they were going to offload somewhere down the uh, river and then we carried on our own after that but that uh, gave us a little bit of a, a push on. <coughs> That's the captain. And uh, they very generously, though we did actually pay them, they very generously <coughs> fed us as well with uh, the little sort of local unleavened bread uh, into the sort of earthenware oven. That's amazing. Yeah. And the bread and some uh, which was slapped onto the side of the oven and peeled off when cooked. Um, that and a sort of lamb stew, a vegetable stew, actually wasn't bad. I mean we've been eating pretty awful stuff <laughs> over to then, it actually wasn't too bad at all. And I have to say the Arab people there were lovely people, they were fantastic. Mm. It really helped us. We actually had to stay at a village once and um, and they put us up in a, just a mud hut and in the morning went down to the boat and there was an old chap with a Lee Enfield rifle who had been standing guard all the time over the really? night, all night through the night. And they did this without asking. <laughs> it was lovely. That's amazing. Once we came out from the Persian Gulf then down Basra um, and onwards to the, or into the Persian Gulf, 
uh, we went to Kuwait, and then Kuwait to Bahrain. And in Bahrain, we stayed at the uh, military, which of course the British military was in Bahrain at that time, so you had the Navy, Air Force and Army there. And we stayed at the, uh, we were put up there, and, uh, and we took part in sort of mock rescues with the RAF and the helicopters just to bide the time. Because we couldn't go out into the Arabian Sea until the southwest monsoon had finished, because the southwest monsoon was sort of six to eight, four, six to eight winds all the time. Heavy seas, we wouldn't get anywhere. This is just an abandoned ship that was used as a, as a plaything for a, um, sort of doing rescues mm. and so on. And that's the <coughs> uh, part of the camp, <coughs> British camp. And in Basra, we had a, a, a we were smashed in the side by a um, ferry, and we had to do pretty awful temporary repairs. Uh, we would never have got us any further than Bahrain, and uh, fortunately, the again the RAF helped us get the timber and everything else. So there was us. There's me patching it up, smashed up a bit wow. down the side. Yeah. We're going to start off again. Was that when you were on the boat, or did that happen whilst it was moored? It was moored, and we were up in town getting something. We came back and found the ferry had smashed it, used it as a fender, <sighs> and smashed it in the side. Um, certainly, you know, the, the, the Persian Gulf was relatively calm. We did have a bit of a blow once, but relatively calm. Um, but we knew that once we get out of there, we're going to have all sorts of weather. Mm. And we were waved off by the services sailing club in the river, Dubai. We, we see no buildings there. Now it's just huge, huge amount of buildings. Yeah. There, nothing. It's all. very, very different place, isn't it? It was just a river with nothing else. And this is where we go out to the Gulf of Hormuz. And then... Uh, we went, the first port of call, it's not a port of call, was in Jask in the Rhine, um, which again was just a case of doing the paperwork to get in, and then onwards down the south Iranian coast. Um, these are obviously some of the locals. around Jask. And then onwards there we went on to Karachi, Pakistan. Uh, this is then you're seeing the uh, Pakistani people. Um, and their local boats sailing. We stopped in one place called Guada, which is a fishing harbour, uh, prior to Karachi. And there they're just drying all the fish uh, before sailing them off. And actually one of the British India Steamship Company ships who we'd befriended to give us help when we needed it, if we needed it, um, used to come in and take the cargo off and take it to Karachi. But it was only a bay, it wasn't a harbour. This is Karachi dentist with a tray of teeth fighting with a wood file. Wow. <laughs> Just incredible. And from Karachi <coughs> we set sail. We actually picked up a cat in Karachi we called a Nell. Mm -hmm. And she joined us for all the way down until one port in Indonesia where she jumped ship. Um, but uh, this was entering the first port of uh, India, and uh, I have to quickly look at this. Port Oka. Um, anyway, we 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 had to anchor off, not anchor off, but sea anchor off. It was right at night. We knew this was a very difficult passage to do. It was blowing quite hard, a good six anyway from the north. <coughs> and then make the approach to go through this narrow entrance between rocky reef either side. And uh, it was uh, quite hairy, we broached a few times, 
being pushed down through there, but eventually we got in there. And then we were taken by the Indian Navy that were there, who then stripped the boat out because obviously they weren't talking very much to the Pakistani, so Karachi, they were almost at war. And we we're going down the coast of India towards Mumbai, as it now called, and these were the trading boats we would see going down with us uh, that have come across usually from Dubai, or oh, that's uh, the Trusilovan states, to Mumbai, Mumbai then, and that's the gateway into India. And we kept the boat there for a while and then took it out from the uh, water because we had a, a bad leak in the keel and taken out into the dockyard. We found that it had a uh, trader worm and that had cracked the whole keel across. Uh, and they put a steel uh, strap in the whole thing and bolted it together again, which it seemed to work. And by now, although we had sailed on down the coast of India for some way for a few good few days, we were given the opportunity of going across the Bay of Bengal <coughs> with a British India steamship because the monsoons were changing. So they were coming bad again in the Bay of Bengal and we would either have to wait six months before we could go across somewhere in southern India or go across and then hopefully carry on from there once it got to Malaysia and that's how we did it. And then you come to the Malaysian coast We've got the fish villages out on stilts all the way down the coastline. Some of them are, have been destroyed and you've got the stumps just sticking out of the water which was not uh, very good when you're travelling down at night but fortunately we didn't uh, get damaged by them. And then uh, eventually getting ourselves down to Singapore. We had Christmas down the coast of Malaysia um, with uh, uh, a chicken, roast chicken and some alcohol and a Christmas cake with the gift from the, uh, the BI ship and this is down the Malaysian coast where we stopped for Christmas where they had a snake charmer which we <coughs> and we got eventually down to Singapore <coughs> where we stayed over the new year. Got ourselves together, ready for then the last section of the trip really. Uh, it was going down through the Indonesian islands and then across the Timor Sea to Darwin. And this was really a headland which was right on the equator in Sumatra, <coughs> which we passed into the southern hemisphere. We sailed quite a bit up the little tributaries and creeks in Sumatra that are absolutely fascinating with the wildlife around. But we did get stopped by the officials and dragged back uh, because we hadn't obviously cleared anywhere going into Indonesia. We had to then get cleared with them before carrying on down the coast <coughs> and then uh, crossing eventually to Jakarta. But the uh, Sumatra in that area is just simply jungle and uh, wild boar, flying foxes, monkeys, etc. But you did have the trading boats still using sail, uh, mainly trading timber from Sumatra down through to Jakarta. So we passed these as we went down, did the passage down and across. <coughs> Just a, a shark swimming around us for a while. which were many, including, a, a, we had for many, many nights, a, a, I think they called it the Australian whale or something. It was a, not a big whale, but it was a, always with us at night, snorting away hmm. <laughs> Amazing. as the night went on. A lot, of, um, a lot of things going on around you, around there with the sharks and the whale and the porpoises and the fishing yeah. and the sailing cargo boats and so on. It was lovely. Eventually we came down through the islands of uh, Indonesia 
um, and across the Timor Sea to Darwin and here the both the customs and the medical officer was coming out to greet us. We had to we had a, a transmitter on board, so we had to let them know where we were and where we were. And we were towed in, but then both of us had to go to the hospital immediately before doing anything else and getting checked out for TB. So I'm not worried about. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we got there, we did a reenaction of by another cameraman, uh, an <coughs> Australian cameraman reenacted this this sailing into Darwin and this time was one of the few times you see David who's the, uh, the film cameraman had been with me on this 342 day trip Wow and the state of the boat yeah, as well it's incredible. Time. And it was one long, long epic, it wasn't like you went away from the boat and came back to it. You just stayed with it and just kept on plugging yes, on. Yes, yes, yes. Amazing. No, we never, we never stopped and took a break. Yeah. No, that's it. Cool. Nice. Yeah. It's, yeah. It is mixed up though. Some of those where you say we're in the Mediterranean were in fact in Indonesia or something like that, but I mean it was that. Yeah, uh, the cutting was yeah was not that good. It was a lot missed out. I love yeah. the cat in there. Yes, because we've actually got you know the photography side. We've got it in the book. You've got Nell. Yeah, and all those sort of things were just nice. Yeah, and she stayed down there. And she jumped ship in. Uh, uh, not sure which island it was. In some ways, it's good because she would have been put down arriving in Australia. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't have had her in, so no. she had a chance. Yeah. yeah.